Well, as you guys know, I've been working on this like little newsletter application, and I decided to switch it from being hosted on Vercel to going down a path of hosting it myself on Amazon. And I wanted to talk about why, and I also want to talk about like the pros and benefits of using something like Vercel versus using something like Amazon, and kind of show you the rabbit hole I went on by trying to do things the cheaper way than Amazon. One thing I'll point out is Vercel is super convenient, right? I, I don't think I've ever used anything that's as convenient as this application if you need to deploy your next application. So if you're working in Next and you want a quick place to just deploy something, I don't think there's anything that beats this, right? This has like Next.js first class support out of the box. You can, you know, you get all the, uh, the edge deployments for your API, your middlewares and stuff like that. The issue I have with it though, is that I think if you read the, yeah, yeah, the license for the hobby, it says for non-commercial projects. So if you ever have a project that's going to potentially make money, and you probably have to read the, comp the fine print of non-commercial, right? Like, what does that actually mean? If I have a business and I just wanted to host a homepage on Vercel, is that considered commercial? Like, is my, is my home landing page that drives traffic to my business, is that non-commercial? Probably not. That's probably classified as commercial. So if you're ever deploying a UI or an application that's kind of linked to you making money, you can't use the hobby plan, which means you have to use the pro plan. And this is where... It's the breaking point for me. I hate services where the pricing is based on user and not based on usage. That's just me, right? I rather know that if I have a application hosted that's only hit 10 times a month, that I would rather be charged for those 10 requests than to be charged for $20 a month per user, right? I'm just working as a solo dev on most of my projects, so 20 bucks a month is not that big of a deal. And this is probably like, a drop in the bucket in terms of money um, for a larger company that has, you know, maybe five or 10 users all working on the same application. Now, I will say, I'm not sure what the user means. It says for teams. So if you're working at a large scale corporation, you have 500 people, but you only have 10 people working on a specific project. How does that pricing break down? Again, it's kind of unclear to me and you have to go and like read through the licensing and read through like the terms and service and stuff. But then also the thing that really is concerning to me is that if you happen to be using more than this bandwidth or whatever, you then have to go and contact the sales team to know how much your stuff's going to cost. I do not like obtuse pricing on things, honestly. Um, now, will I ever, ever need the enterprise plan? Probably not, like for any SaaS project I built. But I just don't like being locked into services where I'm going to be potentially paying thousands of dollars for something because I got a lot of traffic. Now, again, like I said, this is probably one of the easiest way to deploy next application if you don't really know much about backend and DevOps and stuff like that. So I decided to instead, uh, I'm going to tell you why switching over to Amazon and doing all this stuff manually probably isn't the best approach if you don't know what you're doing. I wanted to switch over to Amazon and I wanted to have the API part of my next app. I basically decided to split that out into its own decoupled deployable express route and I want to host that on a single Lambda endpoint. Okay, so I decided to start going down that path where I have an API directory, which has an express app. And I pulled in a package called serverless to take that express app and deploy it to a single Lambda. It sets up a custom domain for me it bundles up my deployments. Um, it sets up some environment variables on my Lambda function, and then it sets up some API gateway stuff. So right off the bat, you have to kind of know what you're doing if you want to try to save money and deploy directly to Amazon. And figuring all this stuff out, it took me a while. It took me like a couple of hours. But I could imagine a beginner who doesn't really know what they're doing taking days to try to figure out this serverless configuration, especially with the Yarn workspaces I'm using. I just ran into issue after issue with like the hoisted node modules being in a higher folder, which I, you know, led me down a path of I had to bring in this package. And I'm not even confident this is this is truly working. But I will say that everything is hosted on Amazon right now using lambdas from my API. And the front end, the next application is deployed to CloudFront. Now, how did I get that going? Well, if you look at the UI here, um, I added a deploy step, which runs next build and next export. And when you run next export, you get an out file, or you get an out folder that you can basically use to upload to a CDN. Okay, so that's kind of like, I take this folder, I upload it to a CDN, and this is what you basically see when you go to my, my uh, website now. 
So if I go to newsletter.webdefcody.com, this is actually pointing to a CloudFront distribution. So let me show you how I set that up. Again, all this was deployed using something called AWS Amplify, which again, was a lot of extra stuff that I had to read up on and try to figure out. And it's not as developer friendly as using just something like Vercel. So I have my UI here that has Next and it has the out folder, but I wanted to decouple the way that we're deploying our Next app by basically creating an infra folder, short for infrastructure, and it has a UI directory here. Now inside this UI directory, I set up an Amplify project that basically tells it to look at that out folder and deploy that. Oh, why does this have WTF here? Let me, let me get rid of this. Um, so it basically looks at the out folder and it's gonna deploy that to some Amazon services. Now behind the scenes, this Amplify thing is setting up an S3 bucket. It's setting up a CloudFront distribution. It's uploading all of that content from the out folder to your S3 bucket. It's linking your CloudFront distribution using an origin to the S3 bucket. There's a lot of stuff going on under the hood that Unfortunately, some of that stuff leaks up too because it didn't take care of my certificate. So I had to go into ACM and I had to set up a certificate for my domain. I mean, none of the stuff is too hard once you learn how to do it, but learning how to first do it is where it's really, really overwhelming. So I set up my certificate so that I can have any subdomain at WebDiv Cody inside of Amazon and have it get the green, you know, HTTPS lock uh, SSL cert. So, but when I first deployed this with Amplify, it you know, gives you a domain like this, right? So you have to go here, you get the domain, but this is like not what you want. You want a custom domain. So to get that working, you actually have to go and edit your CloudFront distribution. You have to add your alternative domain name here. You have to go and you have to add your certificate you just created. By the way, when you create your certificate, you actually need to go and make sure it gets verified. How do you do that? Well, you have to click into your certificate. They give you a C name that you have to add in to your Google domains. So I came over here and I added, um, I don't know which one it is. It's probably, it doesn't really matter. One of these is going to verify the certificate. The other one is pointing my subdomain to the CloudFront distribution. So the point I'm making is, so going back to my original thing about the cost of Vercel and the cost of Netlify, some of this stuff is actually like worth the money. Like, is it worth $20 to deploy a little side project? Probably. Cause if you don't know all these steps I just took, to get an application deployed using Amplify and using the serverless framework, which honestly the serverless framework seems like it's kind of old and I don't know if people even maintain it that much anywhere anymore. I know a company actually like works on this stuff. It works pretty good, but it just leaves a bad taste in my mouth after, you know, trying it out. Yeah, so like if you're not a DevOps or AWS cloud engineer, there's so much that you have to kind of know about Amazon to even like start working with this stuff. Like at the very least, you have to know ACM, you have to have, you have to know cloud front, you kind of have to know cloud formation because behind the scenes a serverless YAML is creating a cloud front formation uh, distribution. I think Amplify is using cloud formation as well, which is basically a way to do infrastructure as code, but it's using Amazon's built-in mechanism. So if you look here, I think I have one for, yeah, here's the Amplify cloud formation that's basically hosting my UI. Uh, here is the cloud formation that's being used for the API. And like, there's a whole nother schema that you have to learn about using cloud formation kind of, I would say a lot of this is abstracted away. You don't need to know about it, but it is important to kind of know it exists. And then for my Lambda functions, right? When I deploy my Lambda function, I get it here. Um, you have to know how to set up your environment variables correctly. You have to know how to use AIM. IAM to basically create a user in a policy with programmatic access so that you can attach those keys to your Lambda so it can have access to your database. Then you have to go and you have to create your database manually or using Terraform or Amazon SDK, you have to write scripts that'll basically spin up your database if you're using DynamoDB. So there's a lot of stuff that you have to do to host a simple little website, right? This is the website. It's literally two pages and it hits like one endpoint to subscribe to a newsletter. That's it. But the amount of work that's involved with using Amazon, um, it kind of starts to grow really, really quick when every single service in Amazon is basically closely coupled to other services. So you have to like dive into all these services to understand what the heck you're doing to deploy any of this stuff. And then you have to make sure that you're good with the infrastructure as code 
because you don't want to do click ops where you're going in through here and setting things up by hand. You actually want to create scripts that automatically deploy all this stuff for you. So with all that extra complexity, you might ask, well, why would you even use Amazon, right? Well, again, at larger companies and larger corporations, you're going to end up saving money if you have a dedicated person who knows how to do all this stuff and can get your application deployed to Amazon. Because the amount of money I'm going to end up paying um, for my application, like I'm even, I'm even sending emails, right? Emails, if you were to go to like MailChimp.com, I know I'm going off on off, off, I know I'm going off on a side tangent, but this is important when it comes to like pricing. Let's go to MailChimp and look at pricing. So if you look at the standard $20 a month pricing or even essentials, you can send 5,000 emails a month. Okay. You know how much it costs to send 5,000 emails a month, uh, a month in SES? It's like 50 cents. So why would I pay $13 a month for something I can do for 13 cents in Amazon? Okay. So you do save money. By using Amazon, in fact, if I go to my billing dashboard here, I'll show you. I probably spent, um, I've spent five cents total having this UI deployed, having the API deployed, having the DynamoDB set up, having the SES. I sent I think over seven hundred emails already. And simple, that's the most expensive cost is my 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 emails, right? Six cents for my emails. Everything else, zero. And I don't even think I'm on the free plan right now. I think I'm. I've been, you know an Amazon user for a while, so they kicked me out the free plan. So that's kind of like the point I'm trying to make. So when you are at a larger company or corporation, it's always about trying to reduce costs, okay? If you're at a startup and you're in a small scale team, it's about velocity and getting those features deployed out as fast as possible to users and not having to worry about all this. But again, since like part of my job is being a DevOps engineer and getting all this stuff managed and deployed to the cloud, I rather do that, the manual steps, because I already know how to do it. But for someone who doesn't, right, the, the alternative is you have to use one of these paid services that basically spin up your application and deploy it to, you know, an, an edge, edge network or something so that you don't have to waste the time to go and figure out how do you do it yourself with Amazon CloudFront. So that's kind of why I decided to refactor my UI to no longer deploy to Vercel and why I kind of split this up into a bunch of Yarn workspaces. I wanted to decouple the API from the front end, which I never was a fan of having your API nested directly in your, your next application. It seems kind of, kind of messy, but I could see the benefits if you're trying to run as fast as possible and you don't care about like following clean architecture paradigms or decoupling different things in your systems then yeah, I, I could see why you want to use Next or the T3 stack and just quickly deploy that to Vercel or quickly deploy that to Netlify or Railway App or Fly.io. There's like hundreds of these services out there. And the funny thing is all these services literally end up just building on top of Amazon, right? They probably just spin up their own EC2 instances or their own um, Docker containers and they just use Amazon resources to basically host your stuff. And again, the closer you get to the, the bare middle, right? So if you can get a bunch of servers in a good network speed and you have a server rack in your own company and you have like a dedicated person to take care of that, your operation costs are going to be like the lowest possible, usually. Now there's a bunch of like nuances of like how much does it cost to pay that expert to come in and manage the servers? How much does it cost to pay a system admin to come in and make sure everything is updated and secure? And that's where you have to kind of decide you know, which, which path is worth doing. And typically if you're in a small company or a startup, the path worth doing is something like Netlify or Vercel or railway app, because you don't want to waste time trying to deploy your little one page application to somewhere. But as systems get larger and you're working more like an enterprise environment, you end up needing these more and more services that Amazon provides, such as SQS. If you wanted to basically set up, you know, message brokers and decouple different systems from other systems, how do you do that? Well, you want to use SQS to kind of communicate and send messages. So the larger your application gets, the more use cases you'll find that Amazon solve for you. And it's super intuitive and easy to use these versus managing your own like active MQ or rabbit MQ message broker. You just want to use SQS. Or let's say you wanted to send messages to everyone's phone. Well, they have something for that already. They have SNS. Or let's say you wanted to do some type of like internet of things. Well, they have an internet of things 
I think they have like an IoT. They also have like a event bridge. I don't think I've used that one. But what I'm trying to say is they have so many existing services that basically solve so many sub problems in the software engineering and web development space that I think learning Amazon from the get go is just going to put you in a better position, especially if you're a beginner. You're trying to find a job and you say that you know how to go into Amazon and deploy these things like that's going to look really nice. And having any type of cloud experience is just going to put you over anyone else when it comes to interviews. Anyway, that's all I wanted to talk about. Hope you guys enjoyed my rant. If you did, give me a thumbs up, comment, subscribe, press the bell icon. And like always, I have a Discord channel. You can join if you want to talk to me directly or just find a place to ask questions to other developers. And lastly, I have a newsletter that you're welcome to subscribe to if you want to get tips and tricks in the future about React or JavaScript or web development. Have a good day and happy coding.